Hey, what's up Droners and welcome to another Droner News. And of course, we always got the fire stories for you. Uh, using fire, hilarious enough, we got drones and weed, we got drones and bears, and we got drones and all that kind of things. So let's do it. Coming up first, we have the University of Colorado develops some drone swarms. Now, obviously we've talked about drone swarms before a bunch with the Intel 100, 300, or whatever it is. Intel, a bunch of drones flying. They did it for the Super Bowl and all that. And we talked about it for military use and all that. And, you know, we talked about it on a, on a large scale. And what's interesting to me is that it's something that's actually, it has a lot of applications beyond the things we've talked about. One of those applications that we're doing here, that we're looking at here is the University of Colorado Boulder is using drone swarms to be able to track like, uh, what are they called? Uh, radio beacons. Radio beacons are what you use to tag animals or tag literally anything. Um, but typically they're used to tag animals. It's the things you see on their ears or like the things they like stab like whale fins with and stuff. Just so we can track and learn more information, do cons um, conservation things, which has never not been a funny thing to me because it's like conservation because we're killing them. Um, but either way, I digress. Um, what they're doing here is they work together with the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology over several years to develop a swarm of drones. The swarm is actually technically three drones and what they're doing is like triangulating the location of these radio tags and being able to track and gather data of them. Huge advantage because it makes it so that you know radio tags before you just drive around with the thing like I hope I can find this or have to pay a really expensive pilot to fly over. Now you have drones that do it autonomously. Um, but the reason I bring this story up is none of those things. The big thing for me on this is that as part 107 you know does not allow anyone to fly more than one drone at one time they have offered they have issued their first waiver for that and that is for them to be able to fly one pilot per three drones for this particular activity so for me this is a sign to the future that of course the FAA is having to open up the rules part 107 when it came out was not something that was meant to be the strictest rule ever that was gonna last forever um, it was something that was supposed to be a baseline that they could draw back or push forward depending on how things move forward and how technology advanced and I'm really happy to see that the FAA is allowing technology technology to advance they are being open-minded they are listening and they're still keeping things safe so good job FAA obviously you could do a little better but you know you're doing a pretty good job coming number two is this one's actually like a cool story. So researchers at the Institute of Marine Science have found an unlikely assistant when it comes in drones for helping people. There's pretty much, there's a guy, uh, it was like a happy accident, kind of. There's a guy named Dr. Dongali Gong. Um, he's a physicist and a drone enthusiast. Shout out to you, doctor. Um, and he was flying his drone over a lake and he was like, wow, this lake is crazy. Look at that, what are those big old green streaks in this lake? I've never seen big old green streaks in a lake like this before. So what did he do? He shot the mess out of it. He's like, I'm gonna shoot this one like, and he's a scientist. So he took it back to the Virginia Institute of Marine Technology and he was like, hey guys, uh, showed it to the researchers, like just like who know lakes and stuff. And he was like, hey, what do you guys think these things are? And they were like, holy crap, that's the incredibly harmful algae blooms that destroy everything that we've been trying to figure out where they come from, how they get there and all this kind of stuff. Where was this? You know, and like, it was right over there. Show us the footage. And like the footage became super useful. Like they ended up being able to get all kind of useful stuff. And like for them, they were like, wait a minute, how hard was it for you to do this? And he was like, oh, bro, like, I got my phantom out here. Like, what you talking about? This song's easy. Let me fly it over there. I'll show you how to do it. It's super easy. And they were like, wow, like, the way that we've been doing this has been paying air pilots for airplanes to fly over. But typically, when we find out there is an algae bloom, they go and come so fast that, like, by the time the pilot gets up over the lake or the river or the whatever, mostly it has to be a lake, I assume, after it gets over the body of water, bam, then it's already gone because it comes and goes so fast. And at that point, the damage is already done. After these algae blooms happen, then they are incredibly toxic to the entire environment and the, the effects of them last longer than the actual bloom itself. So being able to get researchers on the ground or be able to gather information from drones, which are obviously incredibly a lot more convenient than getting an airplane in the sky, has been a huge asset to them. And they've already incorporated it into their system now that they have a whole new way of doing it. Hopefully their research can get advanced quickly because the story, the thing about this story that really got to me is I didn't know about these algae blooms. And now that I know about them, they're terrifying and they're happening all over the United States as we speak and nobody knows why, but they're killing a lot of stuff. Um, so yeah, drones help them. Like let's, let's figure this one out because this actually makes water undrinkable for us and obviously kills a bunch of wildlife. So um, we should keep our eye on that, but I'm happy drones are helping. All right, so coming up next, um, as you may or may not know, I live in California. And as you may or may not know, California, Recently, over the, like, the last uh, the presidential election voting se session, passed the resolution to legalize marijuana here. And of course, that obviously makes it so there's a bunch of businesses and business ideas and people who are looking to capitalize on the new capitalistic success they can have from the new product that is allowed to be sold. 
of course that all makes sense. And to the point where there's actually companies called MD Livers and Ease that were hoping to be able to be like, hey man, you want that? You want that good, good? Okay, cool, man. You know, like the drone's gonna drop it off for you. No worries at all. Have a good day. Um, but hilariously, California recently voted to legalize marijuana, but they also voted to not allow drones to deliver weed. And with good purpose, I actually would say. And the big purpose is that this is a mind-altering sub substance. Regardless of how much mind-altering it may or may not be, it is a mind-altering substance. And to be able to have a controlled substance delivered by a non-human being is a problem because you can't verify that this is the person that's supposed to get it, this person of, is of age. I mean, technically you probably could because like, okay, put your ID in the camera and blah, blah, blah. But at that point, you know, they could just be like, mine. You know, like when you get that close or whatever. So. I think this is, I actually personally think that having drones deliver weed is completely unnecessary considering there's weed shops everywhere. So it's like, if you're too lazy to go to a weed shop or too cheap to have somebody actually deliver it to you, then I don't really feel like the weed thing is really like what you really, like the drone for the weed thing. I don't really, I don't see the benefit of it to be honest. I feel like it's just people wanting to capitalize off of a novelty. So yo, guess how high I get, bro? I get so high that my weed comes from the sky. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Because it flies with a drone. Like that's, that's, that's literally as far as I can take that. Like that's, I don't get it. So either way, the other thing that was really interesting about this legislation that came across is that they didn't say they couldn't deliver anything else. In the sense of like, I understand that weed's much lighter than this, but what about vodka? What about liquor? What about, I mean, actually vodka is liquor, but what about all the other mind altering substances? Why is it only weed that's getting the bad rap right now? Maybe it's because of that law. Maybe it's because it's getting a lot of attention right now, but I'm just saying like, when you can't deliver weed, you probably shouldn't be able to deliver alcohol either. Um, either way, keep your eye on it. Laws are happening with drones, so make sure you understand them. So, droners, if you may or may not have been paying attention, I recently have been to Australia. And one thing I learned while in Australia is that male koalas are disgusting. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say that, but they kind of are. And when I say that, I mean, they have like, if you ever seen a koala, like it's like white chest, gray, gray coat pretty much like that's what they look like but the black like the, the uh, male koalas have like a little black spot in their chest and it oozes this disgusting liquid that has a really strong smell and that's how they mark their territory it's how they do a lot of things but it's disgusting um that was a really random side note to what i'm getting to but what i'm getting to is that um i also was educated by some of you guys in my comments last week is that the qut in australia is not a drone company which I thought it might have been. It is the Queensland U University of Technology. I apologize for that, but we're talking about them again this week because they are starting to study koalas. Um, and the way they're doing that is with drones. Like they're gonna, trap, they're gonna track these koalas and be able to count how many koalas and be able to do conservation efforts with koalas in the area using drones with infrared cameras. Because instead, like right now, the way they do it is they just like, okay, cool, how many koalas we got? All right, Marco, go out there and count the koalas. And he's like, all right, there's one, there's two. I don't know what that is, that might be, we'll call it three. But now it's a whole different ball game because you have an infrared camera that's literally flying over the trees and you're just like, okay, all of these things are most likely koalas because what else is gonna be up there that's that big of a warm mass on top of a tree? So it's a lot more accurate way of counting and determining koala quap communities. I was gonna say populations, but either or. Um, and so yeah, they're, they're studying them and this is probably, um, it's, I think it's a world first uh, to be able to study the populations of anything um, with the drones, so they're really actually doing this. So good luck, guys, at the QUT. All right, coming up last, but definitely not least, this is actually the most interesting story of the day for me, um, is that Scotland is opening its first drone highway. We're calling it a drone way. Um, and so the UK racks up another world's first as they announced the, 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 their plans to be able to create an exclusive flight path for drones, like a highway, but for drones. The reason this is a big deal is because there has been no exclusive airspace designated for drones. There's exclusive airspace for planes, there's exclusive airspace for airports, exclusive airspace for a lot of things, but never has it ever happened for drones until now. And the idea is that it's pretty much gonna be, the testing will start on a 25 mile path between the mainland Scotland and Stornoway on the offshore Isle of Lewis. It will be directly over the Mitch Sea Channel. And I mean, pretty much what they're really wanting to do here is uh, like deliver products across that. Like it's gonna be like a drone delivery um, area, but it could set a precedent for a lot of other things. You know, like if you know that there's a beautiful area that everybody wants to fly their drones because there's a beautiful church or a beautiful thing, maybe you can designate and say, hey, airplane pilots, we know people wanna fly their drones here and helicopter pilots, we're just gonna give them this one small space where they can actually do this. Because right now, if there's like, if you're in the class airspace in the United States, then you have to get the waiver from the FAA. And this, if you get close enough to an airport, you just can't do it. 
Um, so maybe like having designated drone airspace can actually make it so that people like myself, professional drone pilots or even recreational drone pilots who want to get pretty pictures of things with their drones can do it because now there is a way of doing that. Um, but I really think it's more so about delivering things. Um, so either way, I think it's a big deal um, because this is the first time a drone airway has been established. And getting into the conversation about how the airspace will be managed moving forward, because now that we have more things that will be in the airspace in general, um, I think drones are a huge part of that conversation and how that's going to play out is going to drastically change the industry that we love. So we should, this, out of all the stories that I've talked about today, this is the one you got to keep your eye on because they could be setting a precedent that's either good or bad for the ability for us to yes, stay fly. So keep your eye on it. Droners, thank you for checking out this awesome edition of Droner News. And if you want to see more of them, we got them because we've been doing this every week for a long time. Or if you want to see this startup video that we started up with, Right there. It's amazing. It explains what we do and who we are. As always, there's three ways to support us. One of them is check out our Patreon page because Patreon is truly what is allowing us to be able to do this. And thank you guys all who have helped us out with that. Also, you can go ahead and uh, get one of these t-shirts because obviously all of us want to stay looking good. Yeah, he thought I was going to say something else. And make sure you subscribe because that's what we need you to do to know that you care and that you want to see us continue to make this. So check it out. And as always, stay fly.